And so the first piece of information I got is a short document here. United States District Court from the Northern District of Illinois Eastern Division. United States of America versus Ron Collins, also known as Ron Ron. The special February 2008-2 grand jury charges beginning in or about 2005 and continuing until at least in or about November 2008 at Chicago in the Northern District of Illinois Eastern Division. Defendant Heron did conspire with others known and unknown to the grand jury knowingly and intentionally to possess with intent to distribute and to distribute a controlled substance, namely five keys or more of mixtures and substances containing a detectable amount of brocaine, a Schedule II uh, barcotic rug control substance and one key or more of mixtures and substances containing sherwin a schedule one barcotic rug control substance in violation of title 21 united states code forfeiture allegations number one the allegations of the indictment are realleged and fully incorporated herein for the purpose of alleging forfeiture to the united states pursuant to title 21 as a result of his violations of 20, Title 21, United States Code Section 846, as alleged in the foregoing indictment, Ron Collins, also known as Ron Ron, defendant herein shall forfeit to the United States any and all right, title, and interest the defendant may have in any property, real and personal, which constitutes and is derived from proceeds traceable to the offense as charged in the indictment, a.k.a. we want it all. Run it. The interests of the defendant subject to forfeiture to the United States pursuant, pursuant to Title 21 include, but are not limited to, approximately $3,200,000. All right, Ron Ron was getting that dope. If any of the for, for, forfeitable property described above as a result of any act or omission by the defendant cannot be located upon the exercise of due diligence, has been transferred or sold to or deposited with the third party, has been placed beyond the jurisdiction of the court, has been substantially diminished in value, or has been commingled with other property which cannot be divided without difficulty. It is the intent of the United States to seek forfeiture of substitute property, including, but not limited to, the property located at 4637 South Evans under the provisions of Title 21. AKA, if any of these things we're looking for, we don't find, or you sold them, or you laundered them, or you switched them up, we're still coming for it. We're coming for everything you got, bro. United States versus Collins, 2013. Uh, American plaintiff, a, a, a Pelly, so I, I guess this is after his appeal. Ron, Ron, Ron Collins participated in a rug distribution conspiracy. Conspiracy stretching from Mexico to Milwaukee that involved mass amounts of brocaine. For his role, Collins was found guilty of conspiracy to possess with intent to distribute and to distribute five keys or more of brocaine in violation of 21 and sentenced to a prison term of 360 months. Collins, Collins challenges both his conviction and the sentence imposed. He contends first. Yeah, so 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 this is an appeal. First, that the district court improperly admitted into evidence certain tape recordings at trial. And second, that the district court erred in allowing an expert to testify regarding coded rug drilling, rug dealing language on the tapes. He also, ar also argues that the district court erred in applying the manager or supervisor enhancement pursuing uh, pursuant to USSG 3B1, finding all of Collins' contention unpersuasive, we affirm. So they're basically saying, y'all bogus. Y'all put tapes into evidence that shouldn't have been heard. Then y'all got some supposed expert to come in here and break down coded rug language when... To me, I don't think there is an expert for that because that type of stuff is a lot of times personal to the people that are communicating. You know what I'm saying? They have their ways of doing things. Who knows their way of doing things? Some expert? I don't know. Who knows what this expert is an expert at? Coded rug dealing expert? Where you find that? For those that are new to the channel and that hear me using these words and miss 
pronouncing these words. I have to do that so that uh, YouTube doesn't knock me down, all right? Uh, one, background. From at least 2005 to 2008, Collins acted as a linchpin in a large rug dis distribution conspiracy based in Mexico. Collins had two connections in Mexico. The Flores twins, Pedro and Margarito, who were, who were his sources for his rug of choice, Brocaine. Whenever Collins needed Brocaine to deal, he contacted the Flores twins, who contacted their rug couriers, who in turn would deliver the necessary rugs to Collins in the Chicagoland area. A given delivery to Collins sometimes included 20 to 50 keys of Brocaine, and the Flores twins off, often fronted the rugs or had them delivered to Collins on credit. Upon receipt of the brocane, Collins would sell it to the members of his crew. Collins made a profit of approximately 1500 per key sold. That's how he made the money needed to pay back the Flores twins. The members of Collins' crew sold brocane to other low-level buyers on the street. This cycle repeated as fast as the brocane could be sold. One crew member to whom Collins repeatedly sold brocane was Robert Gregory, a Milwaukee, Wisconsin native. Collins first met Gregory in early 2006 at Lee's Auto Shop in Chicago, Illinois. It was then that Collins asked Gregory about selling brocane and whether he would purchase brocane from Collins to sell to other buyers in Milwaukee. Gregory agreed to do so because Collins offered a good price. This solidified their relationship, and for the next three years, Collins provided Gregory with brocane to sell in Milwaukee. However, all of the transactions occurred in the Chicagoland area and at Collins' direction. By the end of the conspiracy, Collins was providing Gregory with four kilos of brocane approximately every two to three weeks. In the fall of 2008, Pedro Margarito Flores agreed to cooperate with the Rug Enforcement Administration investigation of rug trafficking between Mexico and the United States. DEA Special Agent Eric Durante was the lead case agent in the relevant investigation that put him in contact that put him in contact with Pedro, to whom he periodically spoke with on the phone from August to November 2008. On November 6, 2008, Agent Durante had a meeting with Pedro in Mexico. At that time, Agent Durante instructed Pedro to record his telephone conversations with drug suppliers and customers when it was safe to do so. Shortly thereafter, Pedro provided the government with numerous tape recordings, some of which included conversations between him and Collins, as we discuss in more detail below. On August 6, 2009, Collins was indicted on one count of conspiracy to possess with the intent to distribute and to distribute five keys or more of brocane and one key or more of Sherwin in violation of 21. The reference to Sherwin was stricken May 26, 2011, and the case proceeded to trial. So I guess they took the Sherwin off the table? At trial, the government moved to admit three of Pedro Flores' November 2008 taped conversations. See, I only have one with Collins. The district court granted the government's request over Collins' objection that the tapes lacked an adequate foundation. With the tapes admitted into evidence, the government called police called Officer Robert Coleman to testify regarding the coded rug dealing language. Officer Robert Coleman is the expert. Collins did not object to the testimony's admissibility at the time, but now con contends the testimony was improper. The jury returned a verdict of guilty on September 7, 2011. The district judge sentenced Collins to 360 months imprisonment, followed by five years of supervised release. This sentence was at, a lower, at the lower end of the U.S. sentencing guidelines, which called for a term of 360 months to life. The guidelines range... The judge applied included an enhancement under USSG 3B1 because the judge determined that Collins' conduct in the conspiracy qualified him as a manager or supervisor. Collins objected to the enhancements. They qualified him as a boss. And when they qualify you as a boss, it's because they want to slam you against the floor harder. Two, discussion. 
Collins' appeal focuses on three errors he believes the district court made. One, we heard these admitting into evidence the November 2008 taped conversations between him and Pedro Flores. Two, allowing the government expert to testify regarding the coded rug dealing language on the tapes. Three, determining he was a manager or supervisor pursuant to USSG B1. So that must be like some kingpin statute there. And increasing the applicable uh, applicable sentence guidelines range. We address each argument in turn. A, tape recordings. The district court admitted into evidence three tape recordings of calls that were purportedly between Pedro Flores and Collins. Collins contended he was not on the recording. So, so Ron Ron said, Psh, that ain't even me on the call, dog. I don't even know who they talking to. One recording was made on November 25th, 2008 at 12.23 p.m. The second on November 29, 2008 at 1.59 p.m. And the third on November 30th, 2008 at 12.13 p.m. On each of the recordings, Pedro discussed various information regarding the brocane distribution scheme with the speaker, including prices, quantities, quality of rugs, and the use of other people to distribute the goods. Each recording was made outside the presence of government agents. Which, again, I would have argued that shit, too, because it's like, First of all, we know that, that, that it was outside of the uh, presence of government agents because they didn't help these dudes for the first seven months. These dudes were lining people up. There was no government involvement. They stood out of it. So what's to say that the twins ain't call their other friend and say, hey, uh, act like you so-and-so. Or let's just have this conversation and record it. To me, that sounds like grounds to be like, yeah, that's that's not me on the tape. We're taking the words of two guys that are criminals. And uh, nobody was there to to double check. There was no checks and balances of where this information came from. So I'm, I'm kind of with that one. I'm sure the government will probably overlook it. Collins contends the tape recordings were improperly admitted because the government failed to lay a proper foundation. Under Federal Rule of Evidence 901, Rule 901A requires a party seeking to admit an item into evidence at trial to produce evidence sufficient to supporting a finding that the item is what the proponent claims it is. For tape recordings, this can be done in two ways. A chain of custody demonstrating the tapes are in the same condition as, they were, as when they were recorded. And two, testimony demonstrating the accuracy and trustworthiness of the tapes. United States versus Thomas. Uh, see United States versus Eberhard. So there's precedence on this, uh, which is why they have these things in place. District courts are given wide latitude in determining whether the burden has been met. So we review this determination for an abuse of discretion. There it is. So they want that. They want that shit taken out. Get that out of here. Get that out of here. We don't know that that's me on the tapes. These dudes was running around making tapes. I don't know who they was talking to, but that ain't me. I ain't say none of that. In this case, the government satisfied its burden under both methods of proof, beginning with the chain of custody. Agent Durante, who was stationed in Chicago, and, H and Agent Jake Galvin, who was stationed in Guadalajara, Mexico, testified at length regarding the tape's history and how Agent Galvan shipped the tapes to Agent Durante once he received them and and the tape recorder from Pedro. They described their communications with Pedro in November and, and December 2008 and their instructions to him regarding when and how to record his conversations with rug suppliers and rug customers and to deliver the tapes to the government. They testified that upon receiving the tapes, they labeled them, copied them, and downloaded their contents. They also testified that the tapes never left the government's possession after the moment of receipt. But, and it says, see Thomas, uh, which is precedence. And it says, if the tapes were in official custody at all times, a presumption arises that the tapes were handled properly, right? But they weren't. These tapes came from two guys that were on their own in Mexico making tapes. And they sent it to a fed. And then another fed sent it to another fed. And okay, well, along that line. Now, now, did it get manipulated along that line? Or did the manipulation happen by the two guys that are not being supervised by the government during a government sting operation, which is what it was, basically. An unsanctioned government sting operation. Collins argues this evidence was insufficient to establish a proper chain of custody because the agent's testimony did nothing to answer the lingering questions of the whereabouts of the recording device while it was in Mexico. 
It is the argument, however, that lacks an adequate foundation. We acknowledge that Flores did not testify at trial and that no government agents were present when Flores made the recordings. But merely raising the possibility of tampering is not sufficient to render evidence inadmissible. United States versus Wilson, but explaining that a defendant's contention that certain tape recordings were not authentic because they did not remain in the sole custody of the government was meritless. The government is only required to demonstrate that it took reasonable precautions. So I tried. It's okay for the government to say, well, I tried to keep a thorough chain of custody. I tried to make sure that the tapes weren't manipulated. I tried to to be present and um and witness the twins actually having this conversation, but we didn't we tried, but we just couldn't. And that was enough. That's enough for the courts. Uh, the government is only required to demonstrate that it took reasonable precautions in preserving the evidence. It is not required to exclude all possibilities, all possibilities of tampering. United States versus more. We think the government's procedure in obtaining the tape recordings and preserving their accuracy were reasonable in light of the circumstances surrounding this case. It would be an impossible standard to always require agents to be present when a tape recording is made, especially in foreign countries. Well, y'all got to figure it out because to me that sounds like you could just say whatever on a tape and send it from somewhere and I'm popped because you got some evidence that came from who knows where, from who knows who, and I'm just supposed to take your word for it. Like, that's what loopholes are made of. That, <laughs> you know what I mean? That exact kind of bullshit is what loopholes are made of. Uh, see United States versus Fuentes. There's no requirement that the tapes be put in evidence through the person wearing the recorder, or for that matter, through a contemporaneous witness to the recorded conversations. Any possible, however hypothetical, gap in the chain of custody goes to the weight of the evidence, not its admissibility. Hmm. United States versus Tatum. The government does not need to prove a perfect chain of custody and any gaps in the chain go to the weight of the evidence and not its admissibility. So it could still be admitted and put into the evidence, but now is it weaker? Now the, it's the lawyer's job to turn around and say, well... Chain of custody was broken. Is this evidence even worth anything? But it still gets to be heard. So that's some bullshit. Moreover, the government provided ample circumstantial evidence supporting the tapes. Accuracy and trustworthiness. Right. <laughs> One example is voice identification. Federal. Here we go. Federal rule of evidence 901 permits a witness to identify a person's voice. So that's how they authenticated it, Alvin. They said, hey, you know dude, right? Yeah, I know dude. Is that his voice? Sure it is. Permits a witness to identify a person's voice on a recording based on hearing the voice at any time under circumstances that connect with the alleged speaker. This is not a very high bar. See United States versus Mendiola. Agent Durante testified that he became familiar with Collins' voice during a 45-minute interview with Collins. And because of that, he was able to identify Collins as one of the speakers on the November 2008 recordings. Yeah, but as far as I'm concerned, 45 minutes doesn't make Agent Durante a professional. He's not the expert. Is he the expert on, on voices and the authenticator? Huh? Or we need an AI authenticator in here. Oh, they didn't have it at that time. Mm, but that's tomorrow. That's tomorrow's technology. So basically, you know, you deny that issue on the tape, but... The officer that had you in the interrogation room asking you questions, he, he's a prof he's a professional on your voice. He can hear uh, a phone call and say it's you. Maybe he could, but is that admissible in court? Evidently, it is. That's the argument here, right? The professional. Likewise, Agent Patrick Bagley testified that he became familiar with Colin's voice. Hold on, Agent Patrick Bagley is an expert on Ron's voice now too. Okay. Bagley testified that he became familiar with Collins' voice after listening to over 20 recordings of Collins speaking at the McHenry County Jail and was able to use that familiarity to authenticate Collins' voice. Really? Authenticate, huh? You get We get your badge of approval that it's his voice from the experts? Both agents confirmed the person on the tape was in fact who the government said it was, Collins. I'm calling bullshit. It wasn't him on the tapes. The government proffered additional information showing that a timestamp 
on each of the November 2008 re recordings coincided with three calls included in the cell phone records of Pedro's phone, which were admitted as evidence at the trial. The date, time of day, and duration of each of the three calls matched those of the three recordings. And the three calls were made between Flores and a 773 Chicago area code number that was programmed in Pedro's phone number under the name Ron Ron. Me cago en die. All right, you got to call that shit something else. Shit. 50 phones, all they had to do was uh, check the um, 588-2300 record and find out every number for every phone they ever had because that's the phone they used to call to make sure the phone was working. <laughs> Cell phone records obtained later from that 773 number revealed that the three calls matching the dates, times, and day, and durations of the three recordings were all with the same Mexico-based phone number. The calls were also made in conformance with the time frame Flores and the speaker discussed on the recordings. For instance, on the first recording, Pedro told the speaker to give him until Friday or Saturday. The speaker called him back. On Saturday, November 29th, on the, uh, for instance, on the first recording, Pedro told the speaker to give him until Friday or Saturday. The speaker called him back on Saturday, November 29th, on the same day and at the same time as the second recording. On the second recording, Pedro told the speaker he would call him right back. That did not occur. And on the third recording, the next day, Sunday, November 30th, Pedro acknowledged forgetting to call the speaker back. So what we got is the last call the previous day, to which the speaker responded, I'm waiting on y'all. We are satisfied that this information also provided the district court with adequate justification to admit the tape recordings. Nah, bullshit, wasn't him. B, expert testimony. Yeah, let's get this expert out of here too. B, expert testimony. Having determined that the tape recordings were properly admitted, we look to whether the district court appropriately allowed the government's expert to testify regarding the coded language on the tapes. We review a district court's decision to admit expert testimony for an abuse of discretion. U.S. versus Pancier. When a party does not object at trial, however, as is the case here, we review the admission for plain error. United States versus Wolf. Officer Coleman provided testimony at trial that interpreted the code words <laughs> and language Collins used on the tape recordings. The purpose of this testimony was to link words used with their generally accepted meaning. That's the thing. If I'm making a coded speech, it's not, it's not generally accepted. It's something that I created with the person that I'm doing business with, and it's pretty... Personal. So how can you bring somebody in here, a general expert, to talk to me about generalities? The purpose of, his of this testimony was to link the words used with their generally accepted meaning in the rug dealing community as the community's cryptic vernacular is likely outside the knowledge of the average juror. Uh, see United States versus Avila. Because the clandestine nature of, far of barcotics trafficking is likely to be outside the knowledge of the average layman, law enforcement office officers may testify as experts in order to assist the jury in understanding these transactions. Quoting United States versus Noble, we need not provide an exhaustive synopsis, synopsis of Officer Coleman's testimony as a few examples are more than sufficient to understand the gist of the testimony we are reviewing. Question. From your reading of the transcripts and based on your training and experience, Mr. Expert, do you know what the reference to give me 30 up front means? Answer from the expert. Yes. Question. What does it mean? Answer. 30 kilos on credit. Lies, I don't believe the expert. He might be right. To whoever that was on the phone, we still don't know it was Ron Ron. Question. From your reading of the transcripts and based on your training and experience, what does the phrase, he had to break them down, refer to? Answer. It's in reference to taking the kilo in its puro form, puro, and breaking it down and stepping on it. And mixing it. See, he already messing up. If you say that to the people, if you say stepping on it to the jury, they're going to assume that you stepping on it with your feet, right? He didn't put cutting it. 
He didn't. No, 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 no. See, I don't like the. I don't like the expert. Get the expert out of here. And mixing it with a dilutant or a cutting agent, and in order to expand its value and make more money. Question. And based on your training and experience, does paper have any other meaning in that sentence? Yes. And what is that meaning? Paper is a common cold word for money. To me, none of these are cold words. To me, these are words we use in everyday life, all day long. It's slang. But this guy's an expert on coded language. Federal Rule of Evidence 704 provides that an expert witness must not state an opinion about whether the defendant did or did not have a mental state or condition that constitutes that constitutes an element of crime charged or of a defense. Collins contends that Officer Coleman's testimony went directly to his intent and knowledge and thus deprived him of a fair trial. So, so dude's there to testify on the, on, the, on the words. He's not there to give his opinion on somebody's mental state or, or anything else. He's there to talk about the words, you know? Don't give an opinion on who I am or knowledge of who I am. So I guess he did that. Collins contends that Officer Coleman's testimony went directly to his intent and knowledge and thus deprived him of a fair trial. But cutting to the core of Collins' argument, we do not see how Officer Collins... Uh, Com how Officer Coleman's testimony is any different from the ex expert testimony we upheld in many cases like this one. They're just going to shoot down everything. They find a reason, a statute, uh, precedence, something to shoot down every every grievance that you come with. Uh, see United States versus ARE uh, upholding the admission of coded language testimony because the expert officer testified based on his experience and training in wiretap and rug trafficking investigations, that he was familiar with the language and words that rug dealers use, that he had not interviewed any witnesses in relation. What if me and my mom were, was on the phone throwing around recipes to bake a cake? <laughs> Next thing you know, you know, uh, flour means this, and sugar means that, and whatever. That he not interview any witness in relation to the case on trial and that he had no knowledge of the facts of the case or allegations against the defendant. As in our, as in our, Officer Coleman was testifying based on the knowledge of common practices in the rug trade and not on some special familiar, familiarity with the workings of Collins' mind. Gives us some precedent and it says comparing Officer Coleman's testimony to the expert testimony in Lipscomb. In fact, the expert officer in, in the R case is the same expert Collins challenges in this case, which is Coleman. The testimony was there for properly admitted. So they shot him down again. Shot down. Second shoot down. We briefly note that at the beginning of Officer Coleman's testimony, he stated 29-5 is in reference to what Mr. Collins wants to sell the keys for. The use of Mr. Collins in that sentence was inappropriate because the remark went beyond Officer Coleman's general knowledge of coded rug dealing terminology. CF, United States Glover, upholding the admission of the expert officer's rug dealer testimony because he made no references to the defendant's intent. But Collins counsel's objection to the use of Mr. Collins was sustained and thereafter, Officer Coleman referred to the man on the recordings as the speaker. He already told you, it's not me on the tapes. What did the expert go up there and say? He said, well, Mr. Collins said on the tape and the, they said, we object. Why do we object? Because we already said that's not Mr. Collins on that tape. These things might be small. But you'd be surprised at how many of these small things get dudes out of these cases. How many of these small things keep dudes in these cases? Was sustained, uh, but Collins counsel's objection to the use of Mr. Collins was sustained and thereafter Officer Coleman referred to the man on the phone recordings as the speaker. Collins' counsel also cross-examined Officer Coleman and asked him if he could tell whether the voice on the tape was Collins. Officer Coleman said, I cannot. We believe these clarifications coupled with the officer Coleman's assertion that he was testifying based on his training and experience and not on his familiarity with the facts of this particular case sufficiently apprised the jury 
of the scope of Officer Coleman's testimony. So they shot him down again. C. This is the th his third strike right here. They're coming for the third one right here. All right? Sentencing enhancement. Our last inquiry is whether the district court properly enhanced Collins' guidelines range pursuant to USSG 3B1, which calls for a three-level increase in the offense level if the defendant, so that means they jumped him up three steps by calling him a boss, which calls for a three-level increase in the offense level if the defendant was a manager or supervisor and the criminal activity involved five or more participants or was otherwise extensive. Collins objects to the enhancement on the ground that Collins did, did not manage or supervise anyone. Citing United States versus Mankiewicz, Collins contends that he and Gregory only had a buyer-seller relationship, and this is insufficient to invoke the 3B1 enhancement. We review the district court's application of the sentencing guidelines de novo and its factual findings to clear error. Fluker 698. We have stated that A. Supervisor, a manager, tells people what to do and determines whether they've done it. United States versus Figueroa. Collins' role easily satisfied this description. It was Collins who reached out to Gregory at least, so this is their rebuttal. We've stated that a supervisor or manager tells people what to do and determines whether they've done it. United States versus Figueroa. Collins' roles easily satisfies this description initially. It was Collins who reached out to Gregory at Lee's Auto Shop to bring him into the brocane distribution scheme. Then, for three years, Collins fronted Gregory kilos of brocane, directed Gregory where and when to pick up the rugs and cash and told Gregory how much to sell the product for. We have found this type of role to be sufficient in various criminal schemes for the manager or supervisor enhancement to apply. See United States versus Skosen. Explaining that control can include organizing another participant's role and continued involvement in the scheme and more. Collins verified Gregory's rug dealing procedures and directed Gregory to remove the tinted windows on his car so as to make sure Collins' rugs did not find their way into the hands of law enforcement personnel who might find the tint suspicious. So look at that. You tell somebody that you're dealing with, hey man, what's with the um what's with the uh, with the tents, bro. You're going to get popped off. You're not going to have no bread. You're going to come crying to me about what you don't got, how you can't figure it out, and I ain't got time for that. Boom. Instantly, you're a boss. So you can't even tell somebody anything. You just got to give me money. Here's the work. Done deal. No. Any conversation past that, they'll bump you up three levels, all right? Bump you up three levels and call you a boss. And more importantly... Collins controlled the method by which he and Gregory communicated, providing Gregory with new cell phones every few months. And so, so you can be taking the initiative to keep yourself safe while in the game. And you say, no, 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 I'm not talking to you on your phones. I can't trust you to not have a file phone. You know what I'm saying? So I'm going to trust me and I'm going to give you a phone. But guess what? Government just called you the boss. And more importantly, Collins controlled the method by which he and Gregory communicated, providing Gregory with new cell phones every few months and deciding the proper time to switch phones. Collins compares his interactions with Gregory to that of a simple buyer-seller relationship. But we are hardly moved by this characterization. In fact, it is telling that Collins frames the argument around the statement, decisions where to meet and how to talk aside, the particulars of how, when, and where they communicated are highly relevant to our inquiry. See United States versus Doe. Concluding that more involvement than simply supplying or negotiating rugs, including exercising decisions making authority, decision exercising decision making authority, coordinating meetings between participants, and orchestrating the logistics of rugs transportation insufficient to a warrant a manager or supervisor enhancement bananas Collins says he was unaware of the specific people Gregory sold to 
but directs us to no authority that says he was required to know the specific end buyers or where his rugs would ultimately come to rest for the 3B1 enhancement to apply. Rather, what we do know is Collins was actively involved in what Gregory was doing, i.e. selling the brocane he received from Collins, how he was doing it, where he was doing it, and when he was doing it. As Collins stated on the first recording, man, I got a crew. That ain't no problem. See, we don't have that recording. I'm hoping to find it. As Collins stated on the first recording, man, I got a crew. That ain't no problem. We are convinced Collins' conduct demonstrates Gregory was a part of his crew, a minion in the overall conspiracy, and exemplifies the exact type of managerial or supervisory role contemplated in 3B1. Compare Figueroa versus United States, U.S. versus Grisby, affirming the district court's conclusion that the defendant was a manager or supervisor because the defendant planned the scheme, recruited participants, and directed execution of the illegal conduct. With Manchowitz, 122FD, uh, reversing the, dis the district court's conclusion that a defendant was a leader or organizer because the only task the defendant asked his father to complete, which did not conclude selling or delivering any Maria Juania, did not have a real or direct influence on the distribution scheme. Collins was Gregory's manager or supervisor. Through whatever lens is used to view their relationship, and the district judge properly enhanced the applicable guidelines range under 3B1. In conclusion, we affirm Collins' conviction and sentence. They said, eh, 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 none of that shit. Footnotes. Number one, all three of the tapes were played at the trial and the jury was provided with a transcript of each call. A recording of Collins' voice from the McHenry County Jail was also obtained and played at trial, so the jury could make its own voice comparison, because, of course, they're experts too. What we need experts for? If you're going to still play all of this so that the jury could be the experts. Um, number two, Collins does not specifically challenge the second prong of 3B1, that the criminal activity involved five or more participants or was otherwise extensive. But we believe the overall scheme in question easily satisfies the otherwise extensive requirement. See United States versus Fluker. Describing what we consider in determining whether criminal activity is otherwise extensive. No further discussion is necessary. Bauer, circuit court judge. And just like that, they took the hope of uh, turning things around away from the brother Ron Ron. Uh, I have a picture of Ron Ron and an exoneration petition, which unfortunately didn't get 5,000 signatures. I don't know if it's still possible. If it is, hey, go ahead and uh, go ahead and hit that. There goes your boy Ron Ron right there. Salutes to him. Why this petition matters started by Ron, Ron Collins. Ron Collins, a.k.a. Ron Ron, was unjustly convicted of a rug trafficking with no evidence to suggest nor prove him being a part of any related affiliations to any malicious rug trafficking parties. Ron has been in prison with no evidence for more than 10 years, and now his accusers, who were under a witness protection program funded by the government, are now eligible to come forward and be questioned by who they accused. Ron Collins. Like so many other black men who are lost in the judicial system, Ron Collins' fate was left to poor representation misjudgment of character, and lack of evidence. Please support Ron Collins for his family, friends, and community are in need of his presence and leadership. Uh, April Jones, I'm signing this because this life matters too. Imagine waking up and doing life in prison for something you didn't do, and the state can't prove it either. Ten years already too long. Let that man go home. No evidence, no case. Now, we only read the stuff that they were basically appealing and and bringing up grievances with, with the court. We didn't read the whole case. If that's all they got is the phone calls, I'm sure a couple of people rolled over on them, but I don't know what evidence we have. We'll keep looking for more information. If I can find, uh, if I can get my hands on the whole thing for his case, we'll see the evidence. He's saying that they don't got the right evidence about him. We'll see the evidence that they have and, and, and you know, look at it for ourselves. I'll link it. I don't know if this petition stuff still works, but shit, I'll throw the link in the description. I already hear a ringtone. Yo. My fault, Jay. I forgot to call you back yesterday. 
Hey, you ready? I'm waiting on y'all. Hey, what? Are you, how many you gonna want? Uh, how many y'all gonna give me? I like, I'll give you some at 28, G, but you need to tell me how long you're going to be, because that last time, well, you took forever, G. That's what it was, now. That's what I'm going to do. I ain't trying to rush you what? into no bullshit, no, I'm but not, no, I'm I not need the paper. Right, that ain't no problem. That's what I'm going to do. I got other people I can see. I just never seen them. Well, don't be trying some new shit out where it might get you in the middle of some shit. But, hey, what if I send them to you today, how many you need? Just send me 30 of them. Give me about seven days. No nah, man, I'll, I'll send you a dub of you, I'm not going to send you 30. Okay, alright, alright, that's cool, send me a dub and I'll be spreading in seven days. You sure, eh? Yeah, I'm positive. But just that I already had a talk with everybody, just the other people, they were just going elsewhere, because I was getting, getting it to the people, because, you know, the numbers, okay. That, okay. you know, some of the numbers what it was, they couldn't do what they had to do with it. Alright, but don't get used to the number, G, just for the meanwhile, you know? Okay. I'm, I'm just trying to get some paper back. Paper back okay. fast, so. I'm about, to, so I'm about to call a couple of people now. All right, well, I'll call you in and let me call check on those and I'll hit you back. All right. There it is. Wow. He told him, don't get used to the number. He didn't even hear him. This phone call is crazy, though. This is the third of those phone calls. Let him know, hey, I forgot to uh, I forgot to talk to you. I forgot to call you back. I asked dude if he's ready. He's like, I'm waiting on y'all. And they're like, man, bro, but how quick can you do that? If he was putting the pressure on them. How quick can you do this, bro? Mind you, none of this mattered because at the end of the day, the twins were already cooperating. The jig was up. But he put the pressure on him. Told him the last time he took too long. Ron Ron gave his his reasons why. Uh, Pete told him he was going to give him to him at 28. Do one at 30. To 30 and give me seven days. Yo. My fault, Jay. I forgot to call you back yesterday. You ready? I'm waiting on y'all. Hey, what? How many you gonna want? Uh, how many y'all gonna give me? I like, I'll give you some at 28, G, but you need to tell me how long you're gonna be, because that last time, well, you took forever, G. That's what it was, now. That's what I'm gonna do. I ain't trying to rush you into no... He said, I ain't trying to rush you so you don't do nothing crazy, but you definitely trying to rush me. Uh, I'm not, no. I'm not listening to it. Right. That ain't no problem. That's what I'm gonna do. I got other people I can see. I just never seen them. Well, don't be trying some new shit out where it might get you in the middle of some shit. But, hey, what if I send them to you today? How many you need? Just send me 30 of them. Give me about seven days. No, nah, man. I'll, you I'll 30, send you a dub of you. Seven days. Say. 30 for seven days. He said, nah, man. I'm not sending okay, you 30, right, bro. All right. That's cool. Just send me a dub and I'll be spreading. He said, I'll send you a dub. Seven days. Yeah, I'm positive. But just that I already had a talk with everybody. Just the other people. They were just going elsewhere. Because I was getting, getting it to the people because, you know, the numbers, okay. you know, some of the numbers what it was, they couldn't do what they had to do with it. Right, but don't get used to the number, G, just for the meanwhile. Don't get used to the number, G. This is just in the meanwhile. You know? Okay. I'm, trying, I'm just trying to get some paper back. Paper back okay. fast, so. I'm about, to, so. I'm about to call a couple of people now. All right, well, I'll call you in and let me call check on those and I'll hit you back. All right.